I thought I would start with the startup of you. And, and the reason why I wanna do that is in working with C-suite level people, board members, very successful women in bio. I don't think you, they teach that <laughs> in college. And I always thought as an instructor at UCSD, this be something really good to teach early on. So that's why I want to start with the startup of you to really think, because I'm a marketing professor. So I always think about branding and personal branding and how do you market yourself, right? So that's where that started, the first half of my talk. But the second half, I do want to get into something called a lean startup. And this is from, I have the book. Um, somebody who is very active in Silicon Valley, um, Eric Ries wrote this book called the, the Lean Startup. So there are a lot of good concepts in here that I'll quickly go over in the second half of my talk, because I do think if you guys wanna pick up the book, it is a good read. If those of you that are seriously thinking about getting into tech entrepreneurship or digital health or any of that. Um, but yeah, the Lean Startup, I think is a nice way to think about failing forward as opposed to failing backward. Failing forward means you're trying to find your business model. And I'll get into that more when I get into the talk. But the idea is that even though we might have an idea on a napkin, you have to test it, right? As we were saying about engineering and science, you have to test it. So it's, it nicely brings together like how to think about business model, the whole agile failing forward, and then how do you kind of put it all together? And so that's the topic of my talk today. All right, and then you heard that introduction about myself, so I won't get into that anymore, but feel free to ask any questions because I do want to hear back from you guys. Um, so agenda, um, today I'm gonna start with, like I said, the brand, like what's a personal brand? Why do I need one? Because you guys are engineers, right? Like, what is this? So I'm gonna get into some more of the definition. And then the other part behind branding is your values. So as a coach, I usually work with people about what motivates them about their work, right? So whether you become an entrepreneur or an engineer, something's gonna motivate you about your work, right? So that's the exercise we're gonna do. Like, how do you think about what's motivating you? What's your mission? What's your value? And then after that, <laughs> I wanna get into, once you know your values, and we see companies do this when they sell their brand, right? Like when you think of Apple, what do you think of Apple's values? I know if I see a few Apple devices here. What do you think are Apple's values? Yes, <laughs> profitable. So they go to the luxury, right? They go for high price items. What else? What are some? They're very good, clean branding. Yeah, they simple, right? Yes. Simple, easy to understand. Work. Consumer friendly. What else? Innovation. Yeah, right? The leading edge. Yes, the luxury, right? Luxury branding. Yep. Premium, yeah, yep. going premium. Uh, Apple brand is like your services and your items, how you have to constantly change your mind. So that's part of that innovation engine, isn't it? Right? To innovate, you have to get rid of the old. So that is something that I'm going to get into. Like, how does Apple tell their stories? Right? Because once you know your brand and your values, then you have to actively tell the story. Right, which again, as a founder, as a scientist, you have to share your ideas. You have to tell people about your brand, your ideas, your products, your company, right? So that's why that's important, why we do, we need to know more about stories. Um, so I have a quick exercise called the storyboard canvas I'll get into, but we won't have time to do it in class today, but I wanna introduce it to you guys in any case. So amplifying your brand, the, the other part about talking about your brand, and I know you guys know this much better than my older <laughs> coaches. Uh, you know all about going viral, right? What does it mean to go viral? <laughs> yeah, it spreads, right? Exponentially, not just one by one, it's exponential, right? So there's something about networks that allows things to go exponential. So I'm gonna talk more about that. Like, how do you think about networks and networking, right? Because again, as entrepreneurs, you'll have to be actively networking, 
So I'll get into that. Um, and then I do have an exercise we'll have time to do in class today. It's called like mapping out your network. And what does that look like? And then um, the third part is that lean startup. So a couple of concepts there. The first one I'm going to use is called the business model canvas. You guys may have heard of something called the business plan. This is just another way to do a business plan, but simplifying it. So I'm going to introduce that. And then I'm going to get into some of the lean startup concepts, which is what's an MVP? Not in basketball terms, <laughs> but in lean startup terms. And then what's a unique value proposition? Again, right? All these acronyms. What, what is that? And that really ties back into the values that I talked about, right? What are the values of your product? What are the values that you bring? What are the values your company or products will bring that will be unique? And then lastly, why do we have to discover a customer? Aren't they just there for us? <laughs> so again, Lean Startup kind of has a whole process around how you go about finding them, right? And really matching your products and services to what these specific customers are looking for. Any questions or what, about what we're going to cover or? Okay. <laughs> so I start out with this because um, I know you guys understand about viral, but this is how social media looks, right? Everybody's out there, they have their avatars. And so now I want you to find Homer. Should be easy, right? Giant yellow head, bulging eyes. Who doesn't know who Homer is? Everybody knows, right? Oh, you don't know who Homer is? Oh, no. <laughs> so have you heard of The Simpsons, the cartoon? Yeah, so Homer is the dad, Homer Simpson. So I want you to find him here. You see it? So he's here twice. Do you see both of them? OK. Oops. Here, right? Where's the other one? Down here, right? So this is back to my point. Um, if you're this little product out there, <laughs> how are people going to find you? Right? Or you're this you know, newly graduated engineer. How are people going to find you? <laughs> right? And it requires branding. So that's my lead up to why you need to talk about your brand. So brands, like I said about Apple, Steve Jobs has a brand, right? What's Steve Jobs' brand? Anybody? The turtleneck? Yep, yep. Um, his look, right? There's the look, what else? How about the way he speaks? Very authoritative, right? Like you wanna listen to me because I'm gonna take you into the future, right? So the brand can be about the company, but also can be about the founder, right? And so first I start with the founder's brand, which would be you guys, if you ever develop a company, or as a job candidate, you also have a brand, right? Even as a professor, I have a brand because I know about Rachel Professor. I have a brand, <laughs> right? <laughs> Pluses and minuses, right? So again, how did they see you, right? Again, I know from Rachel Professor, I have some strengths, I have some weaknesses, right? All there for everybody to see. Is it consistent? Year after year, do my students say the same thing? Is it well known? Is it other than my students that know about me? Right? How about my other professors? Did, how do they talk about me? Did they refer you know, their students to my class? Right? See how the brand can be <laughs> in any jobs that you might have. Right? You're going to have these. And so in terms of the definition, there's two ways to think about it. So there is the brand itself, which is a perception, right? So the definition says your personal brand is a perception or emotion maintained by somebody other than me. So I don't get to say, oh, my brand is this. <laughs> I do in a way when I'm designing it, but the actual perception is controlled by everybody else, right? 
And so when there's a perception about you, then you need the second part, which is that part of standing out and being very intentional about what you say, <laughs> what you do, what you share online, right? To allow you to craft that perception. So the perception is out there, but I have to do a set of specific things, right? to make that perception hopefully turn out the way I want it to turn out. So again, back to rate my professor, I don't control what people write, right? But then I do control <laughs> how I do my class, how I treat the students, which will then lead to that perception, yes? Yeah. So in terms of thinking about your personal brand, I'm getting back to, so we talked about the, the definition, right? The now is more about the why. So actually, with the rise of social media, audiences trust people more than they trust the company. And I think that's this, is that the same with Steve Jobs? Maybe, right? I bet Steve Jobs had, a, had, a, had more followers than Apple having followers. Apple has customers, but in terms of followers, right? who really believes and listens to what he says, that's the personal brand. So similarly, back to what I show you with Homer, um, all these people out there saying, I'm great, I'm this, I'm that, right? You'll have to think about how do you wanna stand out? So that's what I'm gonna talk more about, right? The, the art of standing out, the art of being intentional, about crafting your brand so that there is a good perception out there. You can't control everything. There are always gonna be naysayers, right? There are always gonna be people who criticize your products. There are always gonna be classmates that are yours like, why is that person at Harvard with me? She should have never been there, right? You're just always gonna have that. But you can, for the most part, try to, like I said, being intentional about how you commun communicate about what you do, what you do in the community, the kind of products and service you wanna create, right? To speak for themselves, other than you saying, I'm such a great guy. <laughs> so the personal branding allows you to establish that reputation and identity, right? And it's never too late to start. How might you start today as a college student to start branding yourself? <laughs> Be nice to all your professors. Yes, that's one way. Any other? Friends. Yeah, yeah. Let your friends speak for you, right? They're big, you're, they're your biggest fans and evangelists. Who else? Yeah, learn as much as you can, right? Wherever you are on campus. What what else? Connect with people um, over social media as well. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Because. These days, I know, sorry, I, you guys are the COVID generation. So I don't know how many of you had to do school, right? During COVID, that was the only way. But you can also make meaningful connections, absolutely. So I do wanna make the point that founders and scientists, your personal brand's gonna be very closely tied to you, right? Think about the woman that developed CRISPR, Jennifer Doudna, right? CRISPR and her. <laughs> right? Tie very closely together. Her idea and her as a person, right? Very closely intertwined. And then, like I said, companies and founders, Tesla and Elon Musk, very closely tied. Any other examples? How about your professors or maybe your dean? Are they tied to their ideas? Are they tied to their titles? Right? So, so yes, so like I said, as a professor, I'm tied to the UCSD brand, right? So again, you have to be very intentional about, you know, when I talk about the things that I do at UCSD, right? Like being very intentional about the audience and, right? What I wanna talk about my, my teaching career there, things like that. But founders and scientists, especially, your ideas, your brand, your products, your company will be always very closely tied to you. Um, and then, of course, my last word of advice is if you don't actively manage your brand, who's going to do it for you? 
Anybody? <laughs> People that don't like you. Yeah. Yeah. Someone else to define it for you. Yeah. It's, it's interesting because like a brand that you put is like a perception, right? And like for example, there are some brands attached to you that can weigh more than others. Mm -hmm. so, and it, they may be that for one person, it's like for example, the brand that you work in Monsanto, for yeah. me, it might not be important. But exactly. Or it could be negative, right? Could be a negative. Yeah. Yeah. Same with Harvard. I get negatives from Harvard too. <laughs> right? It's all now always positive. Um, but yes, you should be thinking about that. And like I said, this is something I've seen with, with the senior leaders I work with. This starts early. Start thinking about start to think about it early, right? And the way to do that is to be more. It's the assessment, right? How do other people see you? And sometimes you have to just ask, right? So back to your professor's point, how's my work in class, right? Your peers, am I a good team member, right? What are my strengths and weaknesses? So starting in college, are there any weaknesses, right? If I'm an engineer, does that mean I can't apply to a business job, right? Or if I'm a CS, does that mean I'm not good for biotech, right? What are some strengths and weaknesses? Is it consistent? And I think, I think if you go back to Steve Jobs' college years, you'll hear mixed stories, right? Oh, he did a lot of dope, <laughs> you know? <laughs> he never went to class, right? But some of the things he did was consistent. He was always consistently into the arts. He was always, once he was into something, he was 100, 200% in, right? So that's some of the consistencies that hopefully you know that about yourself and know to also address the weaknesses. Um, is your brand now well known? Obviously in college, with some exceptions. Okay, at Harvard, yeah. I did have a few classmates like, yeah, you're already famous, <laughs> right? But that's an exception. But if they're not well known, you have an opportunity, right? You can make it whatever you want versus the person that already comes into the harbor, that's already the genius, whatever prodigy. It's harder for them to brand themselves. Does that make sense? Right? Your opportunity is like the sky's the limit. Nobody knows you <laughs> yet, yet, right? But I want to go back to that Steve Jobs point. like. There was something about him that was unique, right? And over time, he realized that about his strengths and weaknesses. And he famously got fired from Apple. And after that, he learned his lesson, right? Yeah, I need to be a better people manager. <laughs> so that's something that knowing your strengths and weaknesses, if you can keep developing that and being humble, right? Like, yeah, I have some weaknesses, but you know, I'm working through it or I make sure I team up with people who's good at the things I'm not good at. And maybe that's the other lesson I've learned is the one woman in CS, the one woman in applied math, <laughs> that you, you should seek out others like yourselves. Yeah, um, because it's hard to do it all on your own. Okay, so peers, colleagues, professors, managers, fans, detractors, right? <laughs> What did people say about you? And sometimes it's worth asking, right? Um, and lastly, being authentic. So people think Steve Jobs would just tell people, oh yeah, I'm a dropout dope head. But <laughs> um, it's worth thinking about how you want to tell your story, right? Like, how do you want to introduce yourself? So I asked you guys to all kind of introduce yourself. And most of you talked about your college and your um, majors. But over time, do you want to have something more in depth, right? Especially when you're a founder, especially you have a story to tell and we all have a story to tell. So, right, what do you want to emphasize? What do you want to tell about your backgrounds? What do you want people to know about you that's unique, right? I'm not saying your colleges are not unique, but notice how all of your introductions are very similar. <laughs> so unfortunately, at the end of the day, It'll be hard for me to pick out who said what. 
right? Think about that. So if you want to stand out, how might you introduce yourself in this room of peers? If you want to, if you want to, right? <laughs> So yes, you have a personal brand, whether you like it or not. Um, and then uh, back to Homer, right? Um, on the job, obviously the people that you'll want to make an impression on your managers, employees, your peers, clients, right? Other senior people you may not report to or other departments you don't work directly with. And then when you're job hunting, you're trying to make an impression on the hiring manager, right? How much do they know about you? How much do they know about your school? How much do they know about your major? How much do they know about the project you worked on? These recruiters, right? So there are a lot of recruiters working for different companies. Um, networking contacts. So back to what you said about virtual. Yeah, you know, you'll, you probably should reach out to people that you haven't met. And, right, find some commonality and reach out to them. Um, and then former colleagues, people you worked on projects with, people you went to high school with, right? Friends, um, they can all help you, right? You probably have heard this, like your network <laughs> is what's gonna help you land jobs. And then as an entrepreneur, it's very important that you have a brand coming into your investors, right? Those venture capital people, partners, so, um, I know one of the companies I worked on, they sold to a big um, healthcare company. So those kind of partners will be important, right? When you're selling your company, um, who are the other potential buyers? And then obviously, if you're hiring people into your company, right? How do you want to come across as the entrepreneur? Media too, right? How do you speak to the media? How do you present yourself? Anybody else as an entrepreneur? Is there anybody else I should try to make an impression on? Customer. Absolutely, right? And that is actually very key to early stage companies. Your customers are your best salespeople, hands down, right? So later I'm gonna talk about networks, same thing, right? If you're trying to create like an Uber for, I don't know what, um, an Uber for delivering sushi. <laughs> um, you can have salespeople going out there saying, oh yeah, our service is great. But the best one is a testimonial, right? Somebody who got that sushi delivered and like, oh, it was fresh, it was so good, blah, 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 right? So those testimonials will be key. Put this back so I can still <laughs> advance this. <laughs> Okay, it still works. Okay, so let me go over the exercise. So mainly, <laughs> looks like an orange slice, right? What I want you guys to do is to imagine if you're already at your perfect job or developing a company you already developed, right? And then talk about what are some things you'll be doing. So what I'm asking you guys to do is to ask each other this question. So you already created the ideal company or you've already started working at the ideal job, right? Sometime in the future, I don't know when, <laughs> but imagine you're already there. What are some things you'll be doing? What are some values you'll be upholding, right? You don't have to fill out all eight slices or maybe you wanna do 16, it's up to you. But, right, what are some things that you know you'll be doing? right? When you're in that ideal job or that ideal company, what are some things you see yourself upholding? Okay. So another reason, right? In terms of what you ask, why align your values? I'm basically asking you like, what makes you who you are, right? Your passions. And right now you guys are busy building up your skills. And the next thing you'll have to do is figure out that marketplace. So I know one of you said earlier about Apple, one of Apple's brands is profitable, <laughs> right? It's successful because it's profitable. Why? Because their passion for innovation, their skills at building the marketplace and knowing all about Apple customers gives them the sweet spot, right? But imagine if 
they weren't that passionate about what they do, or they didn't have the skills, or they targeted the wrong market. They wouldn't be Apple anymore, right? They'd be some of the also rants. So this is kind of similar to what I'm trying to have you do, like really think about what your values and passions are, and then align that with your skills, right? And then to be truly successful as an entrepreneur or in a corporate place, you'll have to think about the audience more carefully. Um, and I know the social enterprise have an added stakeholder, like the people you're helping, right? Those cancer patients or the lesser developed countries, they can be in here too, right? So, but first you have to be good at these three before you can help those fourth that set. <laughs> Right? You have to have all these aligned before you start helping in that way. I think you guys understand that. Okay, so that's, again, back to the values. We're really trying to figure this part. And so now I'm going to try to give you some skills, right? And also talk about the audience. So the storytelling. Um, any of you neuro? did I hear a neuroscience major anywhere? Ah, excellent. <laughs> Do any of these make sense? Neurocoupling, mirroring, dopamine, and cortex? It does. <laughs> so when you tell stories, do you consciously think about any of this? Oh, you do. So what kind of stories do you usually tell? Yeah. 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 Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. So I like to say this is our brain on, well, there's an old campaign called you, this is your brain on drugs. It's like an egg frying on a pan. I call this, this is your brain on storytelling. So all these different things are firing, right? Like your neural coupling is helping you solidify the story. You're mirroring the storyteller's emotions, right? That's why my kids love lullabies <laughs> or the, the bedtime stories, right? Mirroring um, the dopamine hit that you get, right? From listening to a story. And obviously your cortex is processing what's happening, the plot, what's happening to the characters. So from there, again, I coach a lot of senior people on this. They're like, what? I had to tell stories? <laughs> I'm not an author. I'm not a writer. What are you talking about? And then I kind of have to bring them back down to the science of it. Like, I can tell you on my resume that I'm honest, that I'm a great company builder, I'm this, this, and this, right? But really what lets people understand that is by telling a story. So I'm going to give you more examples, but Steve Jobs is great at this, right? He doesn't just tell you, I'm the smartest guy there is. No, he tells you stories that shows how he's the smartest guy there is, right? So there are four types of stories. Um, and those of you, and my son is an animator, so the Marvel, Marvel Universe, right? Can you think of an example of an origin story from the Marvel Universe? Anybody? Iron Man 1. Yeah. And what was his origin? How did he come to be Iron Man? Yeah, he got captured. He was selling illegal arms uh -huh. to people in the Middle East. And then he got captured by them and held hostage. And then there was like a whole thing there. Yeah. yeah. And then he had to have the iron heart. Yep. yep. Right? So why are those stories so captivating? Why is it important to know Iron Man just as a mortal, as opposed to the superhero. What? Any ideas? What? Yeah. Yeah, we want to know, right? We want to know, like, how did this person become the way he or she is? There's that. What else? Yeah, help you predict the future. And so this the Iron Man bad gone good help illustrate him, you think? It gives you a better sense of who he is as a person, right? Uh, there's one here. Yeah, 
obstacles that he faces? Yeah, yeah. So that actually ties in a little bit more of what I call the fail, failing <laughs> and work in progress story, right? So I'll get to that. But the second one that we tell, right? Storytellers usually tell is a vision story. So I'm thinking sci-fi and Star Trek. You guys have another example or, or even the Star Trek one? What's a good vision? Like a vision, right? Somebody telling you about the future. This is how amazing it's gonna be. Yeah, that's a, a future, right? Painting a dystopian future. Any other vision stories you guys have heard? Yeah, <laughs> yeah. And then who said the cancer one? Yeah, so I wanna acknowledge that too. Imagine a future where cancer is cured. Imagine a future somebody doesn't have to suffer 10 years of chemo or whatever, right? To get through their cancer. Imagine their families being able to take care of them through a pill, right? That would be the vision, right? Painting that amazing future for them. Give them hope, right? That's what vision does for us. The next one is called a value in action. So at least in the corporate world, it's usually how a company tells you how they're delivering their values, right? So how would Apple do that? How does Apple show you they're delivering on those innovation stories or delivering on those Steve Jobs values? Yeah, so how do they do that? Yeah, and it was shot on an iPhone, right? So that's the value in action. Like, look at how innovative our product is. But instead of saying, look at how innovative Apple is, they show you, right? They demonstrate that to you. Um, and then some of the other companies that do that would be Zappos. Have you guys heard of them? The shoes company? They deliver extraordinary service, right? So the stories they tell. doing this like what do you mean i have to show my weakness i don't want my man or my team or my company to know i'm not good at certain things or i fail many times so why would it make sense to tell these failure stories yeah and it's back to that earlier point you said learning and growing and you tell the failures Mm hmm exactly you learn from your mistake and you're ready to move on so any other types this is more for the corporate world i mean obviously if i have any writers in the room they're like of course there are many more stories <laughs> i mean are there any other ones you could think of like i said i kind of narrowed it down to just you know for advertising right corporate advertising or founders trying to tell their vision or their origin stories. Um, are there any other types? Well, satire, right? When you're making like politics uses a lot of satire. Why do you think that's effective? Why is making fun of something effective as a storytelling tool? Yeah. 
making the choice a lot. Yeah. <laughs> right. Yeah. Yeah. Right. Right. When they're making fun of it, they're they're saying like, if you use ours, it'd be that much better, right? But the satire makes people laugh, so there's that entertainment value. Mm -hmm. Right. Right. Although I think in the advertising world, we have rules. You, there are limitations to how far you can take it. I know other countries have different rules around that. Okay, so back to the Steve Jobs example. Um, have you, maybe I could pull up, this will play video, right, with the sounds? Have you guys all seen this ad? The, the Apple guy versus the Windows guy? No, I should bring that up. So, do I have a way to do that on the YouTube? No, in the 90s. In the 90s, um, there are these Apple ads where the guy in the blue is the hip Apple hipster guy. And then the klutz <laughs> is the Windows guy. So I want to play you guys a clip. Where do we go? Just YouTube and then Apple versus Windows. Let's find the guy. Ad. Oh, advertisement. Yeah, Apple versus Windows ad. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think we could. Well, okay, let's see all of them. Oh, we're not going to watch all 38 minutes. Sorry. Okay, that's 90s, right? That's good. I think you get the <laughs> idea. Well, we don't need to go through 30 minutes. <laughs> okay, so. So this Apple versus Windows ad, and Steve Jobs does this too. What do you think the headline was when you look at those ads? What, what's the theme of those advertisements? Apple's better. Yes, right? The simple fact is Apple's better. But instead of showing you the laptop, showing you the laptop, and showing you all the gigs and C's and P's, they personified it, right? The hipster Apple guy is the Apple device. <laughs> the business suit guy is the Windows. So who's the villain here? Windows. Yeah. And in what way? What are they trying to say about Windows from what you saw? Um, yeah. Cookies. Yes, difficult. No use of use. Old fashioned. Old fashioned. Not cool. <laughs> Anything else you gather from that? So yeah, so, and it doesn't integrate, right? Doesn't work well with other things. So that is, even when Steve Jobs holding up the very first iPhone, he does the same thing, right? And so, um, can't remember now, but I don't think he held up a Blackberry, but he's basically saying, you can do everything you do on your desktop here, right? So the villain is the old technology. Right? Everything old, everything not cool is the villain. But he makes it simple, right? I'm holding up the simple thing. They'll do everything. And then he does it through a demo. Right? And then that's when everybody says, like, whoa. <laughs> right? And he does that time and time again because you guys can go back and look for all those Steve Jobs, whatever, big reveal, right? For iPhone 1, for the iPad for um, uh, the iPods, right? Or even the iWatch. Every time they have one of these big reveals, it follows this moment, right? Like we have something to show you, right? And then here's something that you used to do. Wasn't that terrible, right? And then voila, 
I have something really simple here, right? You want to have a computing device all in one place. You want to have a simple way to put together your movies and music, right? All in one place. And then he actually shows it to you, right? I think that's the key. These ads didn't have to do the demo, but he did, right? He actually showed you the device. And then that's when everybody's like, whoa. <laughs> um, so that Windows versus Apple, what kind of storytelling was that? Let's go back to our taxonomy. <laughs> Which one? Which one? Yeah, the, the innovation, right? And ease of use. Well, what were you hearing? I was going to say the vision story. There's vision too. Yeah, we're trying to show you what you could have. Right, right. Although I'd say that all Windows versus Apple had less of that, but Steve Jobs does the vision part very well. Right? And in a way, you might say Steve Jobs does not so much barely, but a little bit of work in progress. He does all of these. Yes. Right, right. Well, there's another reason for that because um, it's it's they call it Wintel, right? So there's Intel, the chip, there's Windows operating system, and then there's Dell, Nalo, Lenovo, and all the other. That's it's the entire system he's attacking, right? But yeah, I think Steve Jobs in his Jobsian way <laughs> was telling not only an origin story, right? The the device and the innovation, also the vision. This is what you could have, and also the innovation in action, right? And then I think I do think they're starting to do some change and learning story, but I. I want to emphasize for founders, this is critical. This last one. Why? Why would this be critical for a founder if you're developing a company? Because can I just tell vision stories and origins all day long? Go ahead. Yeah, you're showing progress and you're learning, right? That you're constantly learning and you are going to make mistakes. And those Failure or work in progress stories will help you kind of soak that in. Am I supposed to be back there? Let's see if I can share screen on your game. If I took this out, that be okay? And then she's only using this. Is that fine? That is the mic. Oh, well, but can she not use the new computer mic? So what would she need to do? Just unplug this. Or unplug this one from the computer. No, just this. Okay. Too bad? No, no, no. I think it's just maybe the battery died. Oh, oh. Can they hear us now? Okay. All right. Oh, I'm good. <laughs> Okay, so yeah, those failure and work in progress stories is important for founders because not everybody succeeds on their first try, right? And you're gonna have to go back to your investors for more funding. So as wisely said, right? You need to show progress and you need to show that you can learn from your mistakes and you're gonna keep moving forward. Okay, so storytelling. Oh, no, it doesn't. That's okay, I'll just use the arrow. Okay. Um, so unfortunately, I don't have time to work through this with you guys, but do we have a handout for this? Just so they can have it, and I'll just briefly describe it. So you guys can go for it. So let me describe each one of those blocks. So this is what I call a story canvas. And the reason why it's a canvas is you have to fill it in, <laughs> right? So when I have my 
students or my coaches work on these. Um, so let, let me start with just a quick example. So, so um, yeah, this one has an example. Um, so this is based on a YouTube video you can pull up yourself from, uh, from what's his name, Mark Bezos. So it's Jeff Bezos' brother, who's actually a volunteer fireman in New York. And so he tells a story, this is a TED talk, that, yeah, the, the, the part I spoke about, that's the example. So he was a volunteer fireman, and, you know, one day he was sent to, like, you know, rescue somebody. But the fire captain said, yeah, can you just go into the burning building and fetch this lady her pair of shoes? And he's thinking in the back of his head, like, shoes? Why, why am I fetching her? Why am I not rescuing the person or the, the, the cat, right? And so, of course, another person came out like, oh, yeah, you know, I did this amazing thing. I saved the person. And he's like, yeah, all I did was fetch shoes. And so the moral of the story is that what was the captain trying to teach him? So when you're burned out of your building, it's winter, right? This poor lady's in her robes. She's standing out there barefoot. What does she need? She needs a pair of shoes. And so the lesson there being, doesn't how big or small your contribution is, you're helping these people in need, right? And isn't that an important story to tell for your employees? And for those of you that are just starting out, like, I'm just this little engineer, right? What can I do? And so that's the key with kind of the key insight, because the part about the shoe is very mundane, right? Like, oh, yeah, I have to go fetch a pair of shoes. But the key for you guys in turning this into an amazing story is back to what I said about your motor neurons and your, your uh, dopamine hit. You're trying to get people to have that aha. And the TED Talk speakers are very good at that. Right? They tell this mundane story and then, oh, there's a turning point. So that's the same thing here. The mundane story is getting a pair of shoes, but the turning point is, wow, what was the captain trying to teach me? Right? Like put yourself in that person who's burned out of her building's shoes, literally. <laughs> right? Literally fetch her the shoes and give her the shoes. And that's when he learned, oh, it's not about me, right? Because initially the story is about, oh, I want to be the volunteer fireman. I'm going to be the person to save everybody. But in fact, when you're really in that place of making an impact, it's not about you, right? And that's the key to the story. Any, you guys have any questions about, I'm sorry, you won't. Yes, I, do, but I would like you guys. Okay, so tying it back to your wheel, right? So not picking on anybody in particular. Um, so, for example, somebody said helping tradi traditionally underserved groups. So, if I were to have to tell a story about that, where might I start? If I want to talk about serving the underserved. You just got the situation in which you had enough. You yeah, actually got to do that. Anybody else? And I'm Zoom too, sorry. <laughs> if you want to talk about the impact, how might you? And this is back to the four types of stories again, right? If I want to talk about helping those underserved. Quite yeah, your own story, right? Your own origin story. How did I come to wanting to help this group? I was one of those, or I helped one of those, right? Or imagine where your group's no longer underserved. That would be vision, right? Or the testimony we talked about with the Zappos, how uh, one of your team members, how your CFO went out there and dug trenches and did something, right? You know, roll up their sleeves and did whatever is needed, right? You could even 
wanted to tell a story about having failed to help somebody. Yes. Be the change. Yes. I had the chance to do it. I did it very badly. But <laughs> that's what motivates me. The last one, right? I'm a work in progress. I'm going to do better. I have all the motivation in the world to, to make that better. So I'm looking forward to those stories. <laughs> you guys will collect it for me <laughs> when they do write it. Okay, so that gets into the second part of my topic. So obviously, when you have your brand and you know the values you want to carry forward, right, and have within your company, build into your products and your services. Um, the next part I want to talk about is what I call strategic networking. So in this topic, there's different types of networks. So I'm going to get into those, um, especially when it comes to networking. There are different types. Um, why do you need one, right? Why is this a strategic network more important than an operational network, for example? And then what's a resource network? So again, a lot of scientists have a resource network. Sorry, they have more of an idea network, but what they really need when they go into the corporate world is they need a resource network. And then your strategic network is very important because that's what's going to increase your visibility. And like I said about being viral, that's what increases your visibility, right? And then when you have a personal brand, you'll have to build a network to support it, right? Because it's not just you saying it, you need all your network saying great stuff about you, right? So that's what's important about networking. So I have another history lesson for you guys. <laughs> so other than taking you back to the 90s with Windows, I'm going to take you even further back to the American Revolutionary. So has anybody heard of Paul Revere? Or some of you from across the pond? <laughs> have you heard of Paul Revere? No, you haven't. Okay, so let me give you the quick um, history lesson. So, when the British came, they were fighting this important battle in Boston, right? So, anybody been in Boston? A few? Okay. So, um, the, the downtown area is over here. Right? Um, and so, um, Paul Revere started out in um, what they call North Beach uh, to, to kind of warn. The residents, right? The British are coming. The British are coming. And so in our history books, we only talk about Paul Revere, right? So he rolled this blue roof, I guess, in Northeast and in Charlestown, up across Mystic River to Medford and then over to uh, Arlington. But then, did you know there are two other people out there warning people? There's also William Dahl. So he did this green room. He actually rolled a little longer even. He started out in downtown Boston and went to Roxbury, Brooklyn, crossed the river to Cambridge, and all the way to Compton. And then there's a third person, Dr. Samuel Prescott, who was all the way out here warning people. So why is it that we only hear about Paul Review? Right? There are all these people warning the British, but we've only heard about this one guy. <laughs> it's his network, right? Because <laughs> it's a networking lecture. <laughs> okay, so that's look at his, his network. Like I said, distance wise, all that different. Sometimes you might say he rode it even a little further. He covered more distance, right? You would think he warned more people because he covered more distance. Paul Revere, eh, similar distance, right? All the way out to Concord, right? The British are coming. This guy went south, he went north. This guy is further out in Concord. Well, Paul Revere had a good network. Because whoever he warned, they warned probably five other people. So that's going viral, right? All these important people that he warned, warned five times more or 10 times more. Any guesses about William Dollars? <laughs> he had a close network. <laughs> Oops. His network, guess what? 
And then now he's in Boston, Rochester, Brooklyn, Cambridge, Arlington, Concord. They all knew each other. So no viral effects, right? He's in his own echo chamber. So does, why does that mean Power Review is more successful? Yeah, he got more people warned. And these were the important people, right? He warned the important people that needed to get the word out. Poor William Dawes. Uh, yeah, we already know. <laughs> Sorry, dude, old news. <laughs> right? So that's the importance of having an open network versus a closed network. So let me tell you about the different types, right? So usually when we're working somewhere, so right now, right, in your university, in your lab, these are what we call operational networks to kind of get your work done, right? You need people in the lab or you need people within the university to give you something to get that done. Or in a job, it's usually because, um, you know, like if I work in a lab, right? I need somebody to, to buy the lab equipment. I need somebody to pay the rent for the lab. Those operational network is usually a closed loop, right? Everybody knows each other. It's easy to get the word out. The personal network, these are your friends and family, right? And I'm guessing William Dawes, these are friends and family, right? my uncle, my aunt, my cousins, right? Again, usually a closed loop. Your strategic network. These are the ones that will help you get funding, <laughs> get the word out, get visibility, right? You know, get to more people, right? Get to a bigger number of audience. So there are a lot of Critical relationships, people within your business, people who are key influencers in their field, that's your strategic network. So question for you right now, do you have one? <laughs> uh, maybe, right? Maybe. Sometimes you don't know till later on in life, right? Because your college peers can be very strategic. Your professors can be very strategic. Even the people you meet here can be very strategic, right? But you don't always know that when you first meet them. So why are they important? Because you can cross more boundaries, right? Back to what I said about Paul Revere. He warn the people that knows other people to get the word out, right? They help you expand, right? They can help you test out new ideas. Because if you only talk to the same people that work in your lab that do the same thing, you kind of get into groupthink, right? Or an echo chamber. So you want to test out new ideas on these boundary spanning networks, right? Just to get more testing. You might also use it as a platform. Like I said about going viral, right? If you want to test out an idea, wouldn't it make sense to get the word out and let people try it, right? Like you see that with new products, people launch it on their, their strategic network. A referral too, right? If you have a good strategic network, you can hire better people. You can get people excited about your product and then they come find you <laughs> versus you go find them. Right? And then obviously a source of funding too, if you can cultivate that network of investors or entrepreneurs too. So I mentioned that um, scientists have usually these two types of networks. So the idea network is when you go to a poster session, right? You exchange ideas, you talk to other people working in similar fields, maybe a lot of times beyond your field, but usually about exchanging ideas, right? Any of you have done poster sessions? Yeah, or share your research, right? So that's your idea network, right? You're sharing your ideas, you're right, right, talking about your research. But then the resource network 
is about bootstrapping, right? So I think just like here, this incubator, <laughs> you when you're starting out a company, you need to beg, borrow, and steal, right? You need to find the resources that is maybe currently used by somebody else, but can I borrow it or can I share it, right? And then these resource networks, same with the investors. Like they don't want to commit to a big whatever, you know, multi-million dollar investment. But if you can somehow like do proof of concept or get to know these people and in some other capacity, then they'll kind of give you the break. Like, oh yeah, I know him from sports or I know this person from another investment that I've done, right? So these resource networks are what I see scientists and founders need to cultivate more as opposed to, I mean, these are just as important, right? You need it for the innovation, but to get your company going, you need this resource network, which is also your strategic network. Okay, so back to networking. Um, any of you have studied this about the network effect? There's a math equation behind it, but of course I don't remember it, but there's a math. So if you think about the old telephone, right? Two cans with a string, that's a one-to-one -one relationship, right? But then once you start having five people talking, you you get a little bit more than just the five one-to-one -one relationships. And then when you have a lot more like 12, that's when you see that, what I call exponential, right? So in, any of you have LinkedIn profiles? Yeah, right? So in LinkedIn, usually you have friends that are first degree, right? People you know already. And then a second degree, is that next exponential, right? Getting to be like this. And then the third degree, you cover a lot of people, right? Like whatever, 60,000 people or a million people, however many, when you count everybody's third degree. So in social media, um, same thing, right? Initially, you'll have to have those customers that love you, <laughs> right? You gotta start like this, right? If you're starting a social media company, it's gonna look more like this. But then eventually you gain momentum, right? And you become like the Facebooks and the LinkedIn's and your network effect is doing the job for you. Every time a new connection is added, that network becomes even more valuable, right? This is why Facebook is worth however many billions and right, match.com is also not worth a lot, right? When you create these networks, the network effect has exponential effect. So, when you're looking at your LinkedIn, chances are a lot of them are back to here, right? There are people you work with, people you go to school with, your friends. And then how do you think about this, right? How do I make it more of an influencer base, more strategic? So that's what I want to get to. Um, so within your network, there's potential for you to become an influencer, right? Other than finding an influencer who's willing to help you, you can become an influencer, right? There's that. And then obviously you might find mentors, sponsors who can recommend what you do. And then they are the ones that can say, oh, yeah, that's a friend of mine. You, you know, connect, right? Like I'll connect you to a friend of mine. Or even, I don't not third degree, but probably second degree, right? Your friends and family and your operation network is more than happy to get you to their second degree. So um, how do we want to cultivate that network? Well, what I call, I mean, this whole process is what I call social proof. So remember what I said about your new ideas? You don't want to publish your ideas, right? You want to write about it, whether that's a research paper or you want to develop a small website, right? To show people what you're capable of doing. Maybe you want to write blogs. Maybe you want to send messages out on LinkedIn about what you're working on. And another thing that I always emphasize um, with my coaches is what I call value added volunteering. So a lot of you have mentioned your impact. Um, 
for less developed countries. How can value added volunteer help you there? If you're like trying to help with patients and you volunteer in a hospital, now right. you know there's a hospital staff that may give you feedback on your ideas. Yeah. Yes. What other value added volunteer could there be if you're trying to accomplish some of these? What can you get out of it? Well, what kind of opportunities? What kind of opportunities could you look for if you're trying to do accomplish some of these, right? You guys have very ambitious goals. <laughs> so I'm talking about like the small step, right? If you want to have people that are helped by what was said here, right? In those values yeah. chart. What, what's the one small thing you could do through volunteering or through what I call value added volunteering? Because while you're volunteering, you're also networking. Travel and do what? Don't travel volunteering. Yeah, yeah, right, right. In these countries, right? To learn more about those countries. Any else? Yeah. Mm -hmm. When you actually spend time with the cancer patients or in these underserved communities or countries, right? Get a better sense of the people that you're going to serve. So that's what I would say, right? Make sure you get take advantage of those, those volunteering opportunities to get your hands on experiences. Um, I would say also become a speaker. <laughs> um, I know in my, in, so in engineering, I can see like, I just want to work in a lab. <laughs> Leave me alone. I just want to work in a lab. But in fact, when I think about people who've been successful founders or scientists even, they have to go out there and talk about their ideas, right? So this gets back to that personal branding. <laughs> Because if I only talk about scientific facts all day long, what would you guys be doing? Asleep. <laughs> so I need to give you stories, right? I need to give you stories. I need to give you testimonials. I need to give you, right? Things, experiences, share my experiences, right? That gets you guys more interested. So when you become a speaker, inevitably you have to do that. Your personal stories, your personal experiences, like I said, inevitably is tied in with what you're trying to do and accomplishing these values. And then, like I said, develop your own followers, right? So I see that a lot with founders because not only are they developing the company, they're also developing followers who may or may not be customers, right? But then they're trying to expand on their personal brand so that investors will know them. <laughs> or when they Google you, they have a sense of who you are, right? Through your followers, through your blogs, through your volunteering, and through your scientific papers, right? See how that all comes together. And again, <laughs> my advice to you is be intentional because in college, you think, oh, I, I did it for fun. But sometimes that catches up to you, right? <laughs> So I'm not saying you need to plan out everything, like being a perfectionist and like, you know, spell checking everything. <laughs> but what I am saying is when you want to put out something about yourself, just kind of take a pause. And does it fit your wheel? Right? Does it fit your wheel? Does it, you know, give you even the tiniest progress towards what you want to accomplish? Right? Yeah. Um, nurturing your network. Um, what do I mean by that? Like nurturing your network. They're not babies. <laughs> exactly. Right. Exactly. And I, I actually have a friend from Harvard Business School. Um, when we went to the reunions, um, he's an engineer. So what was that comment earlier about Windows not doing spreadsheets well? He went to our reunion with his spreadsheet. <laughs> and he had everybody's LinkedIn, everybody's name. And he was actually going down one by one. I got to meet this person. I got to meet that person. I got to meet this person. <laughs> he was checking it off. And I think it works to a certain degree. But you have to have some commonality, right? 
And so that's what I mean. Like nurturing your network means be helpful and like understand where you can help people. So that's what I mean by pay it forward. Because again, when you're a college student, you think I'm so small, I don't make an impact, right? What can I add to the value? But you can add a lot. And the key is to be creative about what you add, right? So for example, like as a professor, my office hours, I can count in 15 years on one hand, how many people showed up to my office hours. <laughs> so is that a reflection on me <laughs> or is that on my students? <laughs> Am I not intimidating? <laughs> Right? What do you guys think of that? Should I have more than just five? <laughs> so how can I get more than just five? <laughs> yes, yes, right. And and that's just it. At UCSD, my students are damn smart. They don't need my help, right? But the key was for them to think about how they can be helpful to me, isn't it? <laughs> the class, yeah, yeah, or projects like um, like these classes, right? Like, give me feedback on these slide decks. So, mm-hmm, yeah, right, right, right. So, I want to encourage every single one of you <laughs> to think about beyond just I'm just little old me, or just I'm here for the class. Think bigger picture, right? Back to your values. How can your professor help you expand the pie of why is important or who benefits? Because I bet you they have a lot to add in helping you figuring out that pie. Anyone else? Anyone else that you want to tap into their wisdom or? <laughs> These guys? Right? On your mentor? Your peers? Your peers too, right? You all have an awesome origin story. I want to hear all about it. <laughs> right? So, yes, um, pay it forward, right? Give before you receive, because a lot, a lot of times, I know, I know this from my scientist and engineer friend, oh, networking feels ick. <laughs> but it's more about your intention. And so if you think of it as I'm here at this conference to learn, or I'm here at this conference to give back, right? Like whatever I learn, I'm gonna take back to my company, my team, my lab, right? And then engage on a personal level. I'm not saying it's not okay to do the spreadsheet networking, but I do think there's something organic about meeting people and showing genuine interest right, and what they do, and hear more about them. And this is why telling the origin story will make it that much more interesting. <laughs> um, so engage on a personal level, leverage your stories, right? Offer to give feedback, right? So when you think about your professors, your mentors, be creative. How can you help? Ask, how can I be helpful, right? Um, and then make introductions. So again, what back to what I said about the second degrees and third degrees. If you know mutual friends that could benefit from each other's knowledge or share expertise, yeah, help help introduce them. That's how you can nurture and maintain your network. All right. Okay, so we have another exercise. Um, we have the handouts for that, right? So I think this should only take five minutes and then we'll do another um, five minute break. So don't worry about this side. This is like the current state. Don't worry about that. I want you guys to do this quick. So flip to this side. And also don't look at this yet. That's kind of the answer. <laughs> but I want you to think about 16 people that are important to you in your professional network. So think about yourself as a professor. Who are the people that you have had contact with in the last six months or, right? Um, whether that's at school, whether that's here, 
and just put down their initials. And then the next step is to connect the ones that already know each other. Right? So if I know L B, I know L W from Brown, I know A H from Brown, they would all cross connect. Right? Is it, you know, in, in that setting, they all know each other. So I have those three. And then maybe the next day I have some IBM. They don't all know each other, but you know, I'll leave that as it is, right? If there are people that they don't know each other, I don't have to cross connect them. And then the next step, I use CSD for the people I know. Again, do they know each other? Do they not know each other? So the lines are saying, let's say I know this person A H from Brown. And this person EW from UCSD, if they know each other, I'm going to put the line. Yeah. It could be your friends, but like I said, who you would consider to be your professional network. Like which one, if you connect all the dots, what does yours look like on, on, on this? Very soon, I am going to start uh, finding them all together. Uh, yes, yeah. They remind me of yeah. somebody else, right? Right. So then, did yours end up being you know, like clusters? Like, you know, like they're here in a cluster, here in a cluster, here in a cluster, or, the, or were they interconnecting? Okay. Here. Yeah. Yeah. How about the rest of you? Did anybody end up here? Like in the somewhat closed category, yeah, like this guy. A lot of my huh? connections come from my school. Yeah, so right. Like know each other, right? What else? They're basically the lineage from my place job, from my school. Yeah. So they do have a name, but they end up like the same thing. So basically, the name of the like square. Okay. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Anybody else has something different? Open, right. Uh -huh. Yeah, yeah. So your US network is very separate from, yeah, and then also your previous school. Yeah, yeah, that's me too. <laughs> because of my different career changes, I'm more like this an open star. So, why do you think this is considered more ideal, these kind of open networks? Yes. Right. You're still the spoke, right? You're still the center. And so the different ideas, if they all say the same thing, then you know, right? Like, oh, there's something universal about this. I don't know if they can hear me. To you. <laughs> oh, they have a comment? No, go ahead. Let's finish and then I'll make sure to count. Um, they know each other and they also know you, so they can vouch for you. Yeah. You can vouch for them. Right. Because you know other people are going to pick you up. Right. Those two back and forth. I was going to say it's funny that like, you have like some very close things and it's hard not to ask questions. So there's these people that like all the other people in the camp because. So we like kind of like right. You might become the influencer. Right. Back to that part of your example. Yeah. If you're the the hub, right? People have to come to you for information. Although you can be a, a what do I call it? Um the block too, <laughs> even, right? So this is the problem with a lot of founders. They become this and they become the information vacuum. <laughs> so yeah, but not for you to worry about yet. <laughs> Go ahead. Yes, they expand even further out. 
Yeah. Right. People want to network that. For each other, yeah. Yeah. So that's back to this William Dodd problem, right? When he sent out the word of warning, they all call each other. Yeah. Go ahead. Uh -huh. I don't know that I can see it, but go ahead and tell me. You know, uh, having a multidisciplinary team is probably a better way to succeed. If, if you know, if your network is just people from science, it's very difficult to, you know, create a valid business case and you kind of, you know, launch the product and everything. So it really takes having people who understand your innovation, but from different disciplines. Yes. yes. Kind of get where you're going. Right. Right. I mean, back to what I said about the idea network, that's why, right? You want to get your idea out to different networks, even though they have some understanding of what you're trying to do, too, so that you're not trying to educate them from scratch. Um, another piece of this is diversity, equity, inclusion, right? Why do we want a diverse network? Different ideas, different perspectives, different ways of approaching problems. Yes. Yes, absolutely. And I do think my career changed when I looked at mine. Well, you can't see this, but my, mine looked like the, the one, the open star. Because mine look like this, um, as opposed to this, when I switch careers, I could always find somebody who knew somebody else, right? To help me out. So exactly your point. Okay, so um, how about we take a break till, oh, any questions? Any other questions on Zoom? Sorry. What? Okay, guys. Um, <laughs> Any questions on this? Does this make sense in terms of looking at your network, understanding how the network effect works, how to maintain it, why you need why you need the idea network as well as the resource network? Okay, no quiz, but <laughs> it, it is, I don't know. Have you guys learned any of this previously? What I'm saying with you? Yes. In what way? Yeah, I just remember the other tech team. Yeah, yeah. Right, right. I mean, I'm I'm putting the science behind it, right? Yeah. Like it's not right. obviously the people part is a big part of it, but you, I know that we have a STEM crowd here, so <laughs> it's always worth thinking about the science behind it too. And, and how do you guys think about networking? I'm curious. What does it mean to you? When somebody said, "Oh, you need to network," or, you know, <laughs> yeah, I just think about like going and getting to like a career fair or like talk to like other events and just talk to people. Yeah, like, talking to people. What else? What else about networking have you heard, seen, or learned? <laughs> well, to be essentially what what's going on in the world. Uh huh. It's like feedback is part of this that. Yeah. Yeah. Right. Right. And I think I'm hearing. Oh, yeah. Get to you in a second. I'm hearing more about. Oh, did you get a degree? Did you get a four four year college degree? Oh, okay, I teach at UCSC, so you're not. You will not hear me say you don't need a degree. But what I want to say is there are many more places to learn stuff, right? YouTube, are you kidding me? Like if I had YouTube <laughs> back in my day, right? To learn anything and everything. Um, and then the internet too. We didn't have the internet, right? So again, think about what knowledge. And now with AI, right? At your fingertips. So it's not so much about what you can learn, it's it's the critical thinking, right? How are you gonna leverage all these things available at your fingertips, right? And how do you fit into that, right? You're in the middle of that spoke, aren't you? <laughs> 
anything else about networks before I move on? People on Zoom too? <laughs> yeah, go ahead. Right, right. And and what kind of interactions do you want to have, right? Because I know on social media, there are people that say, oh, I have a million followers, but do they really know them, right? And again, back to the intentionality, like, do you want the most number of followers or do you want to have those meaningful connections? And same thing as a founder, do you want a gazillion customers or you want 1,000 customers who love you to death, right? And they had their trade off. And right, so same thing in terms of your network. If you have this really open network, there's some trade offs there, right? It takes time to, to help all these different people in different realms, <laughs> right? To keep up with what they do versus if they already all know each other. I only need to talk to one or two, and then the, the information spreads out by itself, right? So, what kind of intentionality do you? And I'm not saying even just the open or the very open is the only network you should have. It's like I said, there's pros to doing this, right? When you're starting out, everybody knows each other. It's very collegial in your startup. Why wouldn't you, right? You work with them, you play with them, <laughs> you develop this amazing thing together. There's nothing wrong with that. But do you want to for career reasons, right? If you're switching careers, then maybe, yeah. You want more of this. And then if you're raising funding, you also want more of this. Go ahead. Is there like such a thing of too much communication, like doing too much about someone? <laughs> um Yeah. Yeah. On LinkedIn, I feel like some people share too much. <laughs> and I'm sure you have Facebook or Instagram friends or Snapchat that share too much. In your opinion, do you think it's too open or very close. I'm not saying you should be tied to anyone. Like, I only want this. I'm saying being flexible. But in your opinion. Yeah. Open. For you guys or for me? <laughs> I'm saying when you're starting out, it's okay to have. But you might want to open it up more for career reasons. Right? Right? But then some scientists, if they're always working in the same lab and develop this amazing thing, they don't need anybody else, right? If they stuck with that same path. But in my career, I switched four times. I needed this, right? Yeah. Okay, um, let me move on. 